So let's just say we have somebody who's 200 pounds, 30% body fat. They want to get to 10% body fat. What's the first thing they need to do? Okay. So the first thing is we want to optimize health, right? And that is, uh, it sounds so obvious, but it's really not because the first thing that people think when they're that overweight is like, oh, I just need to get the weight off. So start cutting calories and start moving and start exercising and that'll make me healthier. And to an extent, that's true, but that's also a slippery slope to uh, head down a path where you are under consuming what your body needs and over training. And then you're stuck in this plateau. You're at 30%, you get down to 20, 25 and you can't budge and you're eating hardly anything and you're training like crazy. So it's very important that we kind of assess where you're at first before. And so this was a big shift, by the way, in how I started, how I would train clients. So my early career, we used to print off a diet. I would assess their, their body fat percentage. Like you just said, what is their goal? their age, their sex, how much they move. And I would spit off this diet. Like, this is what you should eat. Like completely through that way, a, a way of training. And it turned more into this. I, so if you were that client, I'd say, all right, Doug, for the next week, this is what I want you to do. Before we dive into this drop in this body fat percentage, I actually want you to track your steps, to track your sleep and to track your nutrition. And what I mean by all three of those is don't try and impress me. If you don't go for walks every day, don't go fucking take a walk just because I'm having you track it right now. If you don't, you know, if you eat Snickers bars every day at noon, don't stop eating the Snickers bar at noon just because I'm telling you, I want you to do what you've been doing for the last year to two years that got us in this place so I can assess where we're at and then I can make these micro adjustments because believe it or not, reducing down from 30% to 10% is not hard. Now, don't confuse that with it's not it's not hard in the sense of what we need to do. It's hard to be consistent and stick with it and follow it through, right? But as far as the principles, the things that we're going to do, it's actually not as hard as you would think it is. Getting be below 10 is when things get really challenging and really tough as far as tweaking macros and getting crazy. So right now, what I want is I want you to track those three things and I want you to show me what you're doing. Now, what I found over all the years of doing this is that there's almost always something that jumps right out at me nutritionally, right? So uh, over 65% of the people are deficient in magnesium. More than half the people aren't getting enough vitamin D. Almost everybody is under consuming the amount of protein they need uh, for their body. Most people are missing in fiber. Most people are over consuming in sugar, right? So I have all these things and these are all kind of like levers, that I want to be able to pull over the course of the next, say, you know, two or three months with this person. And the first one I'm going to do, and this is, then there's, there's a psychological piece to this is I'm actually going to tell them to go get things before I tell them to take away things. And that might sound crazy. So let's pretend you wrote your diet down and then there's McDonald's, you know, three times and an ice cream a couple times in there. And I don't, and, and those are obvious things that we, you probably know. And I know that are not ideal to diet. But for psychological reasons, I'm not going to say, okay, Doug, cut this, 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 and this all out of your diet. I'm actually going to look at the things that you're missing, which is almost always, like I said, there's always lack of probably vitamin D, lack of fiber, lack of protein. And I'm going to pick like one of them. It's almost always protein. And I'm like, all right, Doug, this is what I want you to do. I want you to hit your body weight in grams of protein, whatever your goal body weight is in grams of protein. So if you're a 250 pound person and you're overweight and you say, I want to be 190 pounds, we're going to get 190 grams of protein every single day. And I'm going to tell you to go get that. And that's all I want to focus on first. Now, why do I do that? If I tell a client to do that, and I'm not telling them they can't have these other things, there's a, there's a psychological game that I'm playing that they don't realize. I'm playing chess and they don't realize it. Is I know that if I tell them they can't have something, we are wired to rebel. And so if you if they feel like they're restricting and they can't and they have and they and they say those things, oh, my trainer said I can't have this, I can't do this, they might have the discipline to stick to that for a while, but eventually they'll hit a point where the, naturally they'll want to rebel. Versus if I say, Hey, I, Doug, you gotta hit your protein intake. That's all I want you to focus on every day. Let's be consistent with that. Let's not miss that. What I know will happen is it is extremely difficult to hit your protein intake every single day while also consuming all this other because all that other 
fills up your calories, fills up your diet, and you end up lacking in the nutrients like protein that your body needs. And so by me simply telling you to go after this protein intake, I know that naturally it's going to cut that out. And I know the power of the psychology of not telling you can't have those things, but just having you focus on it. It's so magical how this happens, right? So that's like step one. And right away, we if we're if we're coupling that with lifting weights, and I normally will start this person off with three times a week, full body training. Just, and there again, there's some psychology to that also, right? Like I know that in the course of the next year that we're going to be training together, there's going to be days that that person misses or there's inconsistencies. And I know if I'm hitting the body full time, three times a week, even if it was a rough week and we only get there two times a week, we're still hitting the entire body twice. And so all those muscles are getting worked. All those muscles are, are getting a signal sent to them that they need to, to develop, they need to grow or sustain. And so I know that that's one of the better ways to start almost anybody off with their training. So three days a week, full body training, and we're gonna and we're gonna hit the protein intake. That literally is gonna take that person in the first month thirty percent down, like five six percent. You'd be blown away just that just that alone. And then I'm looking at the other things nutritionally. I'm gonna go okay. Let's add, you know, uh, you know, two bowls of your favorite greens, right? You like Brussels sprouts, you like asparagus, whatever it is. Again, another strategy of me cleaning the diet up by adding things in there. I'm not telling them they can't have that the bag of chips with their sandwich. All I'm saying is, hey, we need to get this bowl of vegetables also. We need to hit that protein intake now. Those are your two targets. And I'm starting to add things into this diet, knowing it's naturally kind of carving off all these things. While I'm also lifting weights, sending a signal to the body to train. Mind you, I'm also considering I don't want to necessarily put this person in a major caloric restriction either. Like, I actually don't even want to manage calories quite yet. I know they're naturally going to get managed by changing their food choices because eating, you know, six to eight ounces of meat to get to their protein intake is, is way, way less calories than them eating a bag of Lay's chips that is tons of calories, tons of carbs and saturated fat and hardly any protein. And when they get that out of the diet and they replace it with that steak, it's like they get this fulfilling high protein steak and yet they don't get all these extra calories. So I already know that telling them to go after these foods without worrying about managing calories is going to naturally kind of shift the calories in the right place. Again, playing the psychological game to first hit that initial bump. So that's kind of where we start to get the first five to 8% uh, body fat after that. Next, I'm going to start to dive into like their movement. Like I had them track those steps. So I have an idea. The average person, by the way, doesn't get more than 4,500 steps a day. That's the average person. Very rarely do you get, I will ever assess somebody and they're like doing 10,000 steps or more already. Like that's an anomaly. They're like a referee. They walk to work or they have their, it's not normal, right? It's not normal to have somebody 30% overweight and also stepping 10,000 times. It happens, but it's rare. So that person's normally around 4,000 to 5,000 steps a day on, at most on average. Then I'm going to start getting them just to walk more. And we, I normally like to move it in increments of 1,000 to 2,000 steps depending on where they're currently at. So now I'm going to get them to move a little bit more through steps. And we're hitting the, the protein intake. We're hitting our fiber intake. We're training three days a week. We're starting to build some muscle. If I've done a really good job, the scale doesn't move much. So with this person who's this overweight, after 30 to 45 days down the road, they're normally, by the way, discouraged. Adam, I haven't lost any weight on the scale. I'm still 200 and something pounds and they're frustrated. But when I test their body fat percentage, if I did a really good job, I've already dropped down three to five to 8% body fat in this short period of time, but the scale hasn't moved, which means that I've built four or five pounds of muscle and I've lost four or five pounds of fat and then their scale has stayed the same. I actually only want to use the scale for me, not for them, to know if I need to if I need to make any sort of calorie adjustments. That is, if I see someone drop too much weight too fast, then I actually will, will pivot and then I'll, I'll tell them to add even more calories because I don't want to see this dramatic loss. And some people might be going, what? That's what this guy is 30, 30% body fat. They need to lose all this weight. Why would you not want? Well, again, our goal right now is to change body composition, to reduce body fat. And part of that process, I would like to build muscle along the way because that's only going to help our metabolism and only make 
the overall fat loss journey that much easier. If I just cut calories, move more, train hard, sure, I'll get a faster drop initially, but then your metabolism will adapt and then we'll have very little where to go versus if I don't move the scale much, but I add some muscle and I do lose some fat. So the scale weight stays the same, but I've added five pounds of muscle and I've lost five pounds of fat. That's a huge success after 30 to 45 days of training, Matt, even two months. That's a massive success to have shifted our body composition that much, but not move that much on the scale. And that'll, that'll normally go five, eight percent doing that, that, that process. And then after that, then it's, it's, it's getting them to gradually step more and move more and over time subtly getting their strength up because that's going to increase volume in their training, right? So if we, if I can add five or 10 pounds to the bar every couple of weeks on their bench press, their squat or their deadlift, that's adding volume. That increased volume will burn more calories. will send a signal to build more muscle or will acquire more calories that their body needs, which will in turn keep them heading in that lower body fat percentage. And it's literally that gain all the way to 10%. It is constantly just add, adding a little more activity, a tiny bit more intensity. And that one way to increase intensity would be getting stronger in the gym, adding more, more weight to the bar and adding foods to the diet. That's the one that, that really blows people away where they think that's, that doesn't make sense. Like I'm trying to lose body fat, but it is, it's, and it's adding foods at your body, what you should be eating. And what does that look like at the end? It's, it's whole foods. If we can get to, if I'm at a place with this client where I have slowly added to their diet and when, and, and now let's say 30, 45 days, I have them assess and go write down everything you ate this week. If I did a really good job of slowly adding foods, they'll look down at it and they're eating four to six times a day, depending on how hungry, how big, how, how much they're moving a day, four to six times a day. And, you know, big portion of meat, nice serving of rice, sweet potato, yams, quinoa, something like that. And a good serving of vegetables. And they're doing that four to six times a day. And it's all whole food and they're satisfied. They don't feel like they're starving the body. They don't, they don't feel that. In fact, many times they feel like they're eating a ton of food and they can't believe it. If I've done a good job too, with balancing that out, right. All along the way, they, they feel the appetite increasing because they're building muscle and you can easily take that person from 30 down to 10%. Over the course of a good a good amount of time, that's a six month journey, six to eight month journey doing it that way. And if somebody is in a metabolic healthy position without any sort of other things going on, right? Like, and by the way, we started this conversation with optimizing health first, and we didn't address sleep yet. But if I had somebody who is only resting or sleeping six hours a night or something like that, that throws a whole wrench in all of this. And so it's important that even though we're talking about nutrition and exercise, what they should do there. If, if I'm not paying attention to the other stress buckets that they have in their life, then I'm also doing a disservice. And there's a chance that this formula doesn't work. And it's not because this formula doesn't work because it's not proven or it's not the right path. It's that those things take a priority. Like if you're only sleeping six hours a day and your body's stress hormones and hormones are all out of whack, well, then the body's not going to respond. It's not going to build muscle like it's supposed to. It's not going to, it's not going to burn body fat like it's supposed to. And so we have to address those things. So making sure that I'm speaking to them getting good sleep, making sure they're managing their stress, they're eating whole foods, they're adding the things that their body needs to their diet, their strength training three times a week. And that is a recipe for 30% to nice, nice and gradually go. And by the way, you didn't hear me say, weigh your food out. You don't have to get crazy about tracking. The 30 to 10% journey is literally looks like that. The 10% to get me ready for stage. Now we're getting the scale out. Now we're getting, we're, we're getting granular with the, the macros. We are really pushing intensity in the gym and scaling volume over time. Like the, 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 the work to go from 10% to 5% is a whole nother world than getting somebody from 30%, which is a lot of unhealthy people, down to, to 10%. And 10% is a very reasonable, and I'm assuming we're talking about a male, because that's, yeah, yeah. So for, for people like you and I, 
we can see the progress of a client or the progress of somebody trying to do this when they sometimes can't because they're used to measuring progress by the scale. And we've heard you kind of mentioned this, that somebody might be dropping body fat, getting stronger, but because they don't feel like they're quote unquote lighter, they don't feel like they're making progress. What have been some effective ways that you've used to help your clients over the years measure progress without using the scale? So I do like circumference. Um, measurements so we can see like the gains that we're making in our arms, the waist staying the same or going down. So I like circumference and I like pictures and I like pictures once every couple weeks and I, and I'll have them. Uh, so when I was coaching uh, virtually online, so coaching in person was different. I was seeing them all the time, but this became more challenging when I was virtual. And so this was like one of the challenges is like, how do I make sure this person's staying on track and how do I communicate this? And so what I would have them do was take a front side and back shot wearing the same bathing suit or outfit, you know, basically men, it would be like a shorts, no shirt on with that women would be like a bikini or something. And I would want to see the front, the side and the back. And I'd want them to take it at the same time, first thing in the morning, say Friday mornings or whatever. And I'd want that every two weeks or so. And I, I would only use this when they would get discouraged, it's crazy how people cannot see the change on themselves. But as a trainer, you know this, and, and you're really good at being able to do this too. Like we just, we, we've been looking at bodies for a long time. And so when somebody who is like so hung up and insecure about their belly or their arm fat or something like that, that's all they see, right? They don't notice that their shoulders are starting to develop this nice little cap. They don't notice that their waist is starting to taper in a little bit or their thighs are actually getting some shape to them like they, they're building muscle. They don't see that. All they see is the flabby arm or the, the belly fat and they're like, I'm not changing. So I would use those pictures and I would actually go over it with them and I'd have the original ones that they sent me when we started I said, man, Susie, look at this or Doug, look at this, man. When you first started, like, look at how our shoulders were all sloped and you didn't have any, look at the, the development on your shoulders and your traps right there. And man, look at your waistline. You now you're starting to have that V taper. And like, so I would help them see that because they, you have a really hard time being uh non-biased uh and, and subjective when you're when you are you know judging yourself and then also encouraging them to you know see people they haven't seen. It's funny how that that's a great formula for this too, is like, hey, when was the last time you haven't seen a cousin, an aunt, a family, someone who loves you, cares, someone who genuinely cares about you. You haven't seen them in a month or so. And I would, I would prescribe that. You need to go see somebody because I'm telling you right now as your trainer, you're doing great. You're looking good. It's a very slow process, especially when you do it the right way and the healthy way and the sustainable way. It's incremental change. And, and then always point to them, like, what do we do? How much more are we eating? Because if you've done a good job, their appetite has increased. They're eating more food than they've ever ate. They're stronger in the gym. And so I would I would point to those things, right? So part of our job as, as coaches and trainers too is like we, we become so – like everybody hires us to lose weight or to get in shape or to get shredded or so like that. It's like is, is to, part of the process is getting them to see the full health circle too, right? It's like, hey, don't forget. I know you want to look amazing in that bikini. I know we're, we're going to get that 10%. That's my job. I'm going to tell you that. But I'm also – it's important to me that I, I teach you about all the other things that this is providing for you besides just this look. Because if you become so fixated on that, you're going to find out you're never going to be happy. Because guess what? I've gotten on stage and been the rip, most ripped dude in the, in the building, and I can still point out flaws, and I'm still not happy, and I still want – like that doesn't solve that feeling that you have. That is something much deeper rooted than a body fat percentage. So if we don't figure that out along the way of this journey, you're going to get there and still be unhappy. And it's it's 10% isn't going to make you happy like you think it's going to be. So my job is to help you realize all these other things like your libido, your mood throughout the day, how well you're sleeping, how well you get up, your, your, your consistent energy through the day. We got rid of those dips that you originally were talking about, like uh, bloat and, and, and feeling like you're retaining all this water. Like we've gotten rid of that for you. Mental clarity and that, that, that fog that you used to have, like we've gotten rid of that, like how sharp you, like your performance at work, like, man, this is a beautiful part about this profession and what you're doing in this journey you're on. Like, 
it bleeds into so many things into your life that that are that repay you more than just your body fat percentage and please as my client please do not just get fixated on the 10 percent. i promise you i'm gonna get you there that's my job hey sorry to interrupt look i have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off this guide is totally free we're giving it to everybody right now if you want it click on the link at the top of the description below all right back to the show but I, I, I got to help you along the way see all these other things because those are the things that I'm talking about. That's actually what's going to keep you going forever. The 10%, like I'm going to show you, you're going to get there and you're going to be temporarily happy. It, I'm not going to lie. It feels good to look ripped. Like it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. Walk around with abs and people, oh my God, and compliment you. It's a great ego feed. But guess what? Just like getting rich. The same thing, like that shit wears off before. Once you once you've bought it all and you've had all, like, and then all of a sudden you realize, like, oh, shit, like there's more to life than just this. Guess what? Fitness is the same way too. Like you will find out that even being the most shredded person in the world, it's like it's cool for a while, and then it don't even matter anymore. And then all you have to fall back on are all the other things that it's done for your life. And if you've been so fixated on just becoming ten percent body fat, and you lose sight of all those other things then that's why so many people fall off the wagon because we don't have a getting in shape problem in this society. People get in shape every all the time, all over the world. We have a staying in shape problem. We get, we lose the body fat, we get in shape. And then what happens is people realize, oh, what's it all? It's not even that. It's cool. It was cool for a day. It was cool for my wedding. It was cool for Vegas for the weekend. But then it was like, eh, not that important to me anymore because we didn't do a good job of connecting the dots to all the other things that it was providing for you that you ignored because you were so fixated on the 10%. So to me, like part of that journey of doing that and is, is teaching that to your clients while you're also getting them in shape. There's a lot of people that want to get lean. Like that's their main goal when it comes to their health and fitness journey. What would you say are the top rules, the golden rules they should stick to when it comes to getting lean? So I think, one of the rules or one of the biggest challenges I think to communicate to people is how to start. I think everyone's pretty familiar with the law of thermodynamics, calories in versus calories out. Most people understand that in order for them to lean out, to lose weight, that they need to eat less calories than they burn. That's pretty, that's a pretty known fact. Now the problem with that is that most people have yo-yo dieted, their whole life or a long period of time or have tried several crash diets to lose weight in the past and or added all these group classes or running marathons or cardio cardio bunnies, we used to call them in the gym, in order to create this deficit. And what happens over time is the body ad adapts to that. It adapts to how low of calories you're eating. It adapts to all the activity you're doing. And if it's done that many times throughout your life in the pursuit of getting leaner, and then you come hire me and you're like, Adam, I want to lean out. I actually normally send you in the opposite direction you're normally ready for. And this is always a tough one to communicate. And what that looks like is actually eating at a caloric maintenance or even a surplus and going and building muscle first. And the reason why that's so important is this person is in a place normally where their metabolism has slowed way down from yo-yo dieting, crash dieting, doing these cardio type classes or exercises or marathons to burn all these calories because the body is really efficient. And, it, and if you throw this low calorie diet and all this activity, initially you might see a little weight loss, but eventually what happens is the body goes, oh. Doug's not going to feed me any more food, and he's going to make me run every day. I need to learn how to survive. My body needs to adapt. And what that means is, in other words, my metabolism needs to slow down. And this is normally when someone comes to me and they need help. Anybody who has a terrible diet and they eat four or 5,000 calories at McDonald's every day and they stop doing that is going to have a lot of success. But that's not how I get them. I normally get somebody who has tried to lose weight, has tried to lean out, many times on their own and now they're frustrated now they're willing to invest in a personal trainer like me and now now what do I do with them well the very first thing I do with them is I I need to 
speed up their metabolism. And I do that through a calorie maintenance or even a surplus and actually focusing on building muscle, getting stronger. That way I can increase their metabolic rate so that in the future, when I decide to reduce some of their calories, they're in a much more sustainable place. And one of the things you and Mind Pump are known for is giving no BS advice. The last episode we did, did super well with my with my audience. And I think it's because you gave this no BS approach for how somebody can go from like 30% body fat to 10% body fat. And I think when people talk about getting lean, at least in my experience, it's like, okay, I want to build muscle and lose fat. Or I want to, if I'm a, a big person, I have a lot of muscle, I want to just lose pure body fat. Like how can somebody build as much muscle mass as possible while trying to lose body fat at the same time without sacrificing muscle mass? Well, here's what's cool. There's there's two ways to reduce your body fat percentage. So if you come to me and you're at, say, 25% and you want to get leaner, one way is to just go try and lose fat. Another way is to build muscle. So if the scale doesn't move, but I add 5 or 10 pounds of muscle on your body and I don't put any body fat or minimal amount of body fat on there, you will actually go leaner on the on your body fat percentage. So you actually go from 25% down to 24 or 23%. So I think that's the misconception is a lot of times people think that the only way to get leaner is to lose, lose, lose. And that's why they get into this rat race of cutting calories, creating activity, which tends to serve them early on in their journey, but it leads to a hard plateau. A much better approach and strategy is, hey, let's get leaner, but let's do it by building muscle first, because that is metabolically advantageous. You building muscle is going to speed your metabolism up. It's going to mean that your body needs more calories for your current frame. So you can actually focus on building muscle and actually get leaner at the same time. So what that will look like to a person is a change of body comes in. They will look leaner. They will feel leaner. Their body fat percentage will go down, but the scale might stay the same or even go up. And that's where th this is where the the psychological part or the challenge is for a lot of people because if you get a client and we're using the number like 25%, but let's use a higher percent, like 30, 35%. This person has got a lot of body fat on them. And they come to you and they want to lose. You telling that person that the scale could go up or maintain does not sound good to that person. They're like, I need 30 pounds or more off of me. I want a lower body fat percentage. So as a trainer you had to learn how to communicate to them that, listen, I'm going to get you leaner. Just the approach that you've been taught or that you've heard is a good strategy, which is cutting your calories and running is not a good strategy and will lead to a hard plateau and inevitably you giving up and not being able to sustain that. A much better strategy is actually if we go build muscle because I'm going to increase your metabolism at the same time as leading you out and you building muscle. That is the ultimate place to be and the ultimate place to start, even though when you look at it from somebody who is married to the scale, it's really tough to get that person to, to wrap their brain around that because they see themselves as, I'm fat. I need to lose weight. I, they look at the scale and they go, I'm 30 pounds, 50 pounds higher than my college weight or whatever. They have this arbitrary number in their head that they want to be and they're paying me to get them down to that number and then here I am saying I want you to add calories or I don't really care about the scale and that's tough and it's tough for people to wrap and for sure what will happen on this video is we'll get comments ah you know be freaking out what the guy wants to tell people to lose weight but he's telling them to eat maintenance calories or a surplus that's terrible like no that's that's the way to do it and there's so many other benefits, like mental benefits that come with building muscle too, like outside of just the, the fat loss component, so many longevity benefits of building muscle too. And I think that people, they get confused when it comes to building muscle. They're like, all right, do I need to go in and do circuit training? Do I need to go in and do like a one body part a day split? Do I need to go in and do full body? What's your like no BS approach to building muscle? You know, this is funny because... <clears throat> Obviously, it doesn't serve me. I'm in the business of selling people training programs, but I'm going to tell you it's not that complicated. It's not that hard. We overcomplicate this. And the mistake that we make, I think, a lot of times is doing too much again, thinking that more is better. The more I exercise, the more I train, the more I push, the more results I'm going to get. doesn't work that way. 
you first of all, you have to understand when it comes to building muscle, the lifting weights to it, all you're doing there is you're breaking down, you're sending a signal to the body that it's basically it's got a stress. It's going, oh my God, what are these things that we're lifting up and down? This is new to me. I need muscle to do this. If he's going to keep doing this to me every day, the part of the adaptation process is that you go in there, you stimulate, you cause a stress. The body then goes, hey, we need muscle. Well, here's a problem though. The body may say, hey, we need muscle, but if you as a client don't give it the nutrients it needs to build that muscle, then it just hears that loud signal and you don't give it the building blocks to go do it, which also causes a hard plateau and which is also caused by doing too much not feeding the body adequate, not giving it adequate recovery. And so there's a delicate dance of how much we want to stimulate, how much we want to stress with also feeding it properly in order to do that. And what does that look like? It actually looks a lot simpler than you think. In fact, we were just talking about this today on our show. We would literally solve the obesity epidemic. By the way, this will create, this will get clipped and then we'll get all kinds of debate about this. We would solve the obesity epidemic if we could just convince the world to exercise two days a week, full body routine. That's it. Literally one exercise per muscle group, full body, twice a week, literally nothing else. That right there would literally solve our obesity epidemic. Would that mean everybody would be in the best shape of their life? No, I'm not saying that. But lifting two times a week, a full body routine, one lift per muscle group, okay, two times a week is enough to build a, a incredibly healthy, strong, fit body. And then, heaven forbid, you pair that with walking a little bit and some activity throughout the week, and you're going to have an incredibly healthy person, especially if they balance that out with a high-protein, good whole food diet. Like, it's literally, it's that simple, yet that difficult, right? It's the hard, the most difficult part about it is sticking to it, being consistent with it, and not overcomplicating it, and then in doing it every day. Because what gets difficult is you see that, okay, this guy's telling me I only need to lift this much, and I'm and then all I got to do is eat whole food and hit my protein intake, right, and eat whole foods. I, I don't need to weigh. I don't got to measure. I don't got to track like crazy. I just need to eat these whole foods. I need to get my protein intake and then lift two times a week. That's all I got to do. And then they start doing it. And the results don't come fast enough. And then they start tweaking and they start messing with things. Oh my God, it's too much food. Oh my God, I'm not doing enough activity. You know, And they start doing more, thinking that more is going to get them there faster. And sometimes, this is why this is difficult, sometimes in, in, a, in a temporary one to two week, maybe three week window, it might serve them. More activity, more calorie burn. Oh, they might see the scale go down a little bit. They might feel a little bit better because they're doing more, they're exercising more. And so in their head, they start going like, oh, this is the right way. Okay, more, more, more. And they keep going that path. And then the inevitable happens. Right. And I don't know what the current stats are as far as people who are overweight, pre-diabetic, obese in the US, but I know it's gone up and I know it's like way higher than it needs to be. So you're right. I think the average person is overweight and obese, right? Yes. Doing a full body workout twice a week is going to see amazing benefits i think people can even be confused with this when they hear full body it's like well does that mean i just go in and i can just do like a leg extension for my legs i can do like bicep curls for like so what i'm getting okay, at you, you could let me simplify it even further for you then because i see where you're going yeah right? to make sure that somebody's being effective with i'll these be workouts. even i'll even be even more straightforward even more simple even more basic and you i promise you like, like we could literally look at like the big five lifts right Squat, deadlift, bench, row, overhead press. We can, instead of even looking at it like a, a full body routine per muscle, let's not even look like that. Let's do those five lifts, practice those five lifts two times a week. So you literally go in, you do each one of those lifts for three sets. Three sets of somewhere between five reps and 15 reps. You choose. You can stick to five for a while then change the 10, then change the 15. We can get into the why you want to undelay, why that's like really complicating things, like simplifying it as, as easy as possible. This is what I tell my my mother, my father, my, my family members that I'm trying to get in the gym. Like, here's the five lifts. Practice them two times a week, three sets of each of them. Five reps or 15 reps, you choose. You're feeling strong that day, lift heavy, lift five reps. 
Uh, you're not feeling so strong that day, lift 15 reps. You're somewhere in the middle, lift 10 to 12 reps. Literally follow that advice on those five lifts two times a week. And I promise you, you will actually, and paired with eating whole foods, hitting your protein intake, and you will build a physique. And so I think what once people get going with a routine like this, eventually, with if they don't increase their intensity or increase the weight, they're going to kind of pla- I think plateau over time. Like what's your advice for the people that have already, you know, they're, they're getting started on what we're talking about, but they're wanting to make sure that they're increasing the intensity over time to continue to build muscle. So here's, here's a okay, Progressive overload is important to building muscle. Okay. That's what you're, that, what you're alluding to. If you're going to continually see progress inside the gym, building strength and building muscle is important. That's progressive overloading. Now there, we've done an episode before where I think we did the nine different ways to progressively overload. You can slow down tempo. You can add weight. There's a lot of different ways that you can progressively overload the body. But the truth is that if you go in, you practice those lifts I, those lifts I said with the intent of trying to get stronger, you will naturally progressively overload. Meaning the first two weeks that Doug did squats, he could only do 135. But by week three, you felt strong enough you could do 150. So you put 150 on the bar. You are now increasing your volume. That's progressive overload. So you are now overloading the body. You are now going to get stronger. You are now going to adapt. And you're going to go through You're going to continue through that plateau. Now, we could talk about what happens months down the road of consistently eating well and training. And now you're starting to hit hard. But really, for the first year to two years, most people our strength training, they see a pretty good, pretty good, not exactly linear progress, but, you know, I'd say month over month, looking at those lifts, most people can add a few pounds to the bar every month for a good year or two. It's after that, things get more complicated when you become more advanced and you've already built a healthy, strong physique. Now you're trying to get a cover of a magazine physique. You know what I'm saying? Like there's levels to this. And I think part of why, the general population gets so discouraged is because a majority of the coaches, trainers, influencers, YouTube stars that are communicating health and fitness to the general population are really speaking to themselves. Like the advice they need and where they're at in their fitness journey, they're like super advanced. They've been lifting for five or 10 years and they want to get in all the nuances of the the latest study and the sciences of all the different ways to progressively overload and debate which way is better to undulate your training? Like, dude, for the person who is trying to get healthy and fit and has never trained consistently for one year, you give them those five lifts and you tell them to practice it and you tell them, hey, try and get stronger, try and add a little bit of weight. Not a lot, not crazy. Add a little bit every time you go to do that lift. And I'm going to show you somebody who continually sees progress in their physique. You know, people have a hard time delaying gratification. And I think with what we're talking about, it's incredibly challenging. And one of the things that people go to is supplements. And you and I, we both of our podcasts are sponsored by companies that make supplements. However, I know we both have this approach where it's like taking a supplement isn't going to fix your diet. Taking a supplement isn't going to you know, make you build muscle without doing the work. So my question is, what should people make sure they're doing from a health and fitness perspective before they start taking supplements? Okay, I, I mean, I have a, I have a spiel or a, like I don't know a mantra around like like approaching. How do you approach supplements? Because I agree, like we have we are we talk about supplementation, but we always preach like whole natural foods first, right? So when it comes to supplementation uh, and what what should people or shouldn't people do first and foremost, and by the way, this is a this is like this has changed or evolved for me over the course of my 20 plus years of helping people. Early on, as a young kid and a young trainer, I was fascinated by the latest science and the latest performance supplement or whatever fat burner came out. Like I was into all that stuff, like just and you know, totally misguided. Now, when I look at a client and they ask me, "What supplement should I take?" First and foremost, I would I want them to actually go get their blood panel to go get their blood work and go see if they have anything that is way off or they're missing. Now here's some common ones, vitamin D, magnesium, iron. Like these are like the most common things that people are deficient in. And before uh, vitamin B, that's another, that's probably top four, top four, probably vitamin B, vitamin D, uh, iron and magnesium. Those four, 
These are all essential macronutrient, uh, micronutrients. If you are deficient in one of the things that your body needs, like one of those four, which by the way, are all very super cheap supplements to buy, you are far better off supplementing for that than trying the latest peptide or performance supplement or whatever. So that's where I say go first. And why do I say that? Because those four are essential, which means they're necessary for you to have a healthy operating body. If you're lacking in vitamin D or iron, a whole host of problems health-wise can be going on with you. And if you think you're going to get your body to burn body fat the way you want it to or build muscle the way you want it to when it's not running efficiently, it's the same thought process if you go to kick your car into a mechanic and he's like, the timing belt is off, you have no oil in it, and you're like, well, I was thinking about putting rims on it. What do you think? Will that help? Or a spoiler, will that help me be fat? It's like fix what's going on what's wrong with the engine before you even think about any of these other accessories you want to give to it. Supplementation is like that. Before you go waste your money on any supplement, even the best out there like creatine, which is one of the most most proven and best supplements out there, it's still only going to give you 5%. But it's definitely not going to help you even 5% if your body is lacking in essential nutrients. So go solve your nutrient deficiencies first if you're going to supplement. Then the next priority after your nutrient deficiencies would be protein intake. Because the average person, almost every client I ever trained, uh, didn't hit their protein intake. They were, uh, they were lacking in protein. And that's essential to how this conversation started. If you're going to go build muscle, build your metabolism, you got to give it the building blocks. That's protein. An easy generic number, which will also cause all kinds of issues on this YouTube, is one-to-one. -one. One gram of protein for whatever pound of weight you want to weigh. You want to be a 160-pound dude that's jacked, 160 grams of protein. That's what you target. I know what the science says. I know it's 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 kilograms per lean body mass. I understand that, but you tell that to an average client. They're not going to bust their calculator out every single time and weigh themselves to figure exactly what. An easy way to get most people to follow where they need to be protein-wise is whatever weight they desire to be, whatever, however much they want to weigh, eat that in grams of protein. Most people struggle through doing that through Whole Foods. I will always push someone, go to Whole Foods first. That's the best route for us. I want to encourage that, but I also recognize that that can be challenging. So then the first supplement that I think is the most valuable is a protein supplement. So they make sure that they hit that intake. Then next after that is probably creatine, just because creatine is so valuable from cognitive benefits to performance, to recovery, to building muscle. But even then, you're talking about 5% uh, in the grand scheme of things, when you talk about how much nutrition, sleep, water, recovery, all that matters, supplements is so far down the, the totem pole. And if you are going to dabble in it, you're looking at that in that order is how I do it. Yeah, one of my favorite ways to show progress, specifically with with men, is like you know when they first start doing like a dumbbell bench press, they'll be like wobbling, like sometimes they're like 15s, you know, because they lack some sh shoulder and chest stability, and they're pressing 50s. And I'm like, bro, like a month ago or whatever, six weeks ago. You were like, you were almost like rolling off the bench because you didn't have any stability in your your upper body muscles with 15 pound dumbbells. Now you're pressing 50s. Like there has to be like I don't. We don't need a body fat calculator. You you have to have put on muscle. Like it's impossible not to put on muscle based on that. And and you're right. Like people they f they fall out of love. I think with the process they get so excited at first to start this journey, and then once things kind of settle in, they're like. How do I, how do I stay consistent? How do I not fall off the wagon? Would have been some things that you've helped your clients do, like maybe like some things they focus on every day or every week to make sure that they're still like falling in love with this, the process of fitness. Dude, it's 100% what I'm talking about. I mean, check, I mean, I'm a perfect example of this. Uh, yeah, I, it doesn't get much more as far as the pinnacle of being ripped, right, or looking a certain way than, than get, becoming a men's physique pro, right? Like that was like the peak of that. And so how do I stay motivated to keep lifting? it? It's like has nothing to do with the way I look. Like I, so on the show I shared the other day, like it blows my mind. Like I've, I've connected these thoughts. I am such a better husband and partner at home when I get my workouts in. And it doesn't have to be a crazy workout. I don't have to have hit a PR. Just get a nice, good workout. Broke a little bit of a sweat. Got a nice little pump. Feel good. And what I notice is when I get home from work on days like that, 
I just have this, and I don't think about it. It just, I've now looked, I'm, this is me looking out and reflecting like high level. Like I just, I go right to like doing the dishes, straighten up the house, playing with my son, you know, helping my wife out with the honeydew list. And it's like, and then the days when I, I miss training, especially if I miss a couple days in a row and I come home, I just, I want to plop on the couch. And then I don't want to get up and wrestle with my son. And like, uh, then I'm looking over at the kitchen and I'm like, oh, I need to get over there and clean. I just don't, I don't want to do it right now. And like, it is wild, like how different I am around the house. And so I've connected my training to being a better father and a better husband. And that's really important to me. That's the, the place I'm at in my life right now is like, I, I all I think about is being a great dad. And all I want to give my partner is to be an incredible husband, right? And so- I, that that's part of what motivates me. And so I train that way. So when I lift, I'm not in there going like, Oh, I got to hit this PR. Or I got to stack more. It's like, what I'm thinking about is like, man, I get a good lift in right now. And I'm going to feel so good today. When I get home, I'm going to be a good dad. I'm going to be a good husband. And so, and that's my thing, right? So maybe you don't have a kid and maybe you're not married. So it doesn't have to be that. So maybe you notice you crush work. And by the way, every client of mine that I've ever had that is on point with their training and their diet and their, and like that, They've all told me like, man, I'm way more productive at work. I'm way better at my sales job. I'm way better at whatever it is you do. When you are a healthier, fitter version of yourself, you are better at everything. So take whatever it is you like to do. By the way, it could be a hobby. It could be a snowboarder. You could, be, you could do whatever, whatever it is that you do. The healthier version of you is better at that. And so you just got to make, you have to learn to connect those dots. And so a good trainer does a good job of like finding that out about a person, right? So like you and I, we've probably trained everything under the sun from an engineer to a teacher, to an athlete, to like a student to, you know, so if we do good, a good job, like we're, we're, we're learning about them and the things that make them tick, right? If I got this high performing CEO, who's not married and doesn't have a kid. I'm not going to talk to him about working out. It makes me a better father. And like, that's what, why you should do it. Like, <laughs> right, you don't right. give it, but talking to him about how much he's crushing it at work and like, Hey man, how, when you run those meetings, have you ever connected the dots? Like, and I, I we used to ask stuff like this, like, cause I would know this about my clients. Like, Oh, big, big meeting he's got on Friday. Right. He's got to speak to 300 people, or maybe he's got some big deal, big multi-million dollar deal in negotiating. Like, I'm training him and then I'm talking to him afterwards. Like, Hey, can you tell a difference when you have those big meetings like that? Like the way we trained this last week and your consistency around it. And always when you help them make that connection, they go, Oh yeah. You know what? Now you say it like, yeah, no, I felt good. I felt real good going into this one. Or, you know, they weren't training and they, and you help them connect the bad dots too. Like, Hey, you know, we kind of fell, fell off for a couple of weeks. You know, how, how's work been or, how are those meetings or how are those things? And they're like, oh man, Adam, I'm dragging ass and I'm just sluggish in sales right now. And so, you know, that that's the key. The key is figuring out what makes this client tick. What are their passions? Whether that be their home life, their hobbies, their work, whatever it is that they're in there doing, and then showing them and teaching them how much of a how much better they are at all those things when they're a healthier version of themselves and getting them to say, this is why you're going to do this. You know why? Because that's a love. That hobby you do, you're probably going to do that for the rest of your life because it's a hobby. It's a passion. So let your training dictate and or let your training inspire you to be better at your craft or your hobby because you're going to do that forever. And so, but getting 10% body fat, that's like a, a moment in time, you know, or like getting shredded for a show. It's a moment in time that will come and go. And that's not what's going to keep you training forever. And by the way, if you're so fixated on the way you look, and that is because by the way, we have examples of this all over on Instagram of coaches and trainers that are obsessed with the way they look. Those people are still broken. They're, they're, they, they're, they're training from a place of insecurity. They're training because they're still so insecure with the way they look that they have to do those things. And they've, they've presented to you in the world like they've got it all together, but they're just as fucking broken as the 30% body fat guy, maybe worse. And so you got to help them understand that too. Like all these people that we celebrate and we put on pedestals, like they're so special. It's like, nah, most of them are fucking massively insecure and they're running from something and they're, 
they're so afraid uh, and so insecure that they've become obsessed with their the way they look and they're not truly happy they're not truly balanced they're not truly healthy and so yeah my job as a trainer when i'm training these clients is to to teach them all that right because they don't the, a lot of them don't think that i i didn't think that i didn't look at the fittest people you know, in the world and think that they were massively insecure. I, I learned that over years or decades of being in this space of like, oh, shit, they're some of the most broken people. Yet all of my overweight clients look at them and think that they're so special. And I'm like, and so helping them realize that too, like, hey, you know, be careful what you wish for. Like those people, just because they, they walk around with abs year round, do not think for one minute that they're happy or have it all figured out. Like that's not true health. True health looks like the ability to stay healthy, stay fit, but then also be able to enjoy a nice dinner with your wife and have a couple glasses of wine and not feel like you have to count your calories and your macros and, you know, to miss three or four days in the gym, but still be okay and still stay healthy because you've learned that when you miss those days of working out, those aren't the days you also eat your dessert. Those are the days that you stay a little more tight on the diet and you don't eat like and like you've learned true balance you've learned how to utilize you know food and enjoying those things with your family and 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 friends and yet and still balancing it with staying healthy and fit and like that's the place i want to get you and that's what i'm always trying to communicate to my clients is connecting those dots you know i've had multiple like emotional rock bottoms in my life and outside of my addiction emotional rock bottoms in jail my biggest emotional rock bottom was when i was like five percent body fat and had like every ab and was super shredded and i thought that being that would get me like the hot girls and a great relationship and vanity and status and validation and security but it just made me more broken. Like, like, just like you said, like I was the guy that like was chasing that. And I was even more pissed that, I mean, at that time, more than I was when I was even doing drugs, because I felt like this was going to be something that was good for me to be like this ripped because it was like legal. I was like, God dang it. I've been chasing after the wrong thing for so long. And it's just like, it's like, you got to keep drinking out of the cup and you're drinking, you got to fill the cup a little bit more and a little bit more each time to get the same feeling. And you know, I felt that way. And it wasn't until like, I started to unpack like why I was chasing that, that I started to have a better relationship with fitness, because I was the guy traveling on planes with chicken and broccoli. And I wasn't even competing. Like I was the guy that wouldn't go out with my friends and eat because I was worried that I was gonna like not be able to see my abs in the morning. So I totally relate to and get what you're saying in that. Like, you know, sometimes the some of the most ripped people on the internet are just as broken, if not more broken, because they have like, this body dysmorphia, which is incredibly hard to um, to break. I mean, it's super hard. So thanks for bringing that up. It reminds me a lot of my my financial journey. So I had the same insecurities around money and thought that when I reached a certain dollar amount that I would be this happy person too. It's funny how both those things are so similar. You know, that, oh, the six pack abs is going to bring me all this happiness and joy. Oh, the million dollars in my bank account is going to bring me all this happiness. And what you find out if you ever get to experience one or the other or lucky enough to experience both, they're both not. They're both, they're both not the answer to happiness. And there's so many other things in life that are going to bring you joy and happiness and and also health. Because I, I, same thing with like uh, fiscally healthy or financially healthy. I, I mean, I, I talk, I like to talk about financial health. Like I talk about your fitness health. Like there's a, there's a, a good relationship with money that is healthy. And it doesn't mean just having a bunch of zeros in the bank account. Um, just like there's a good relationship with exercise and nutrition. And it doesn't mean you're weighing and measuring and you're never miss a day. It doesn't, neither one of those are right. They're both tools uh, to enhance your life. And you have to learn to to use them both in, in that manner. And it just, I don't know, it takes some time. It takes some, it's taken me a long time. I'm 40 something years old now. I'm finally figuring all that stuff out. Um, but our jobs as trainers is to help fast track our clients there, right? Is to help paint that picture for them. Because just imagine, you, know, you and I are, are fitness professionals and yet we, we were blinded by it for a long time, right? Or we fell into the traps ourselves. So just imagine the average person who absolutely has no idea, who really thinks that all those people on Instagram 
are the healthiest people. Like they, 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 they still connect six pack abs and looking awesome as, as healthy. And what you and I know from our experience and all the people that we've met is like, Oh my God, not only is that not true, it's almost the complete opposite. You know, like when I got into competing, one of the things that I, 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 this was, I was blown away by it. I saw more. Okay. There was a time where I managed a gym across the street from the, uh, the clinic that used to do the, uh, gastric bypass. So I had a ton of people right across the street from Kaiser. And so I had a ton of, of, of people that were like, like biggest loser obese coming through my gym all the time. So I, I dealt with a lot of that. Right. And a lot of those clients. Um, and then I get into the competing world and I say this all the time that I saw more eating disorders and poor relationships around exercise and food with the, the competitors and bodybuilders than I did with the severely obese people looking for gastric bypass. That's how f***ed up it is. That's how f***ed up they are. What they've hacked into or what they've done is they have and the credit that I always gave, gave them is they have incredible discipline. And they have the ability to sacrifice their their friends, their family, their nutrition, their social life to pursue and obsess over this look. And they're they're great at it. They're great at numbing themselves and heading towards this pursuit. By no means are they this shining example of health. And yet our general our clients, that the average person who hires us, they think that they're because those people are portrayed as these, you know, these great examples of health and fitness, and it couldn't be further from the truth. So obviously what we're talking about and going after vanity is like a huge mistake people make trying to go on any sort of health journey regarding like the, the 30% to 10% body fat journey. You know, a lot of what you're, you've shared might be completely like new to certain people because people might read like, Oh, I got to cut carbs. I got to cut fat. I got to fast. I got to do all these things. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making constantly with this stuff that's actually slowing down their progress? By the way, it's the thing that speeds up the progress throughout the gates. So it's very deceiving, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's too much, too fast, too soon and for a lot of reasons. Not just metabolically, that's a bad idea. Uh, nutritionally, that's a bad idea. Adaptation, that's a bad idea. Psychologically, that's a bad idea. When people are motivated and it can, it's either a New Year's resolution, um, your wife or your partner said something that just oh hits you in the core, you know, like, oh my God, you know, it hits an insecurity, right? So you're insecure about something. Doctor tells you, hey, you got to go fix this. So we, we have these moments where we have this extreme motivation around making change, which is good. It's, it, it's like, it's good that you feel motivated that you need to make change. The mistake that they almost all make is too much, too fast, too soon. And what I would tell them is that, you know, the goal should be this is every time you do something in your life that like a, a like a health or a change, a change is ask yourself, like, could I see myself doing this forever? Um, and if, and if you go like, oh, God, no, I wouldn't want to do this forever. Well, that's a that's a real clear indication of like, this is definitely too much, too fast, too soon. And so you have to, and, and the way the body adapts is not the, the more you throw at it, the more results you get. Like our bodies are these incredible adaptation machines. And so the, the body composition change, right? So losing body fat, building muscle is, is there's a lot of science to it. It's not as simple as just do more and you get more. So that's what makes this really do. And that's the mistake that these people make is thinking that way. So, and I, there's a famous thing that I say on our podcast all the time that it, it's gone all over the place, right? Is the, my goal is always to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. So when I approach diet and exercise, I want to change as little as possible in my diet and my routine to elicit the most amount of change. So I'm always seeking for that. I'm always going, okay. And, and I'm always, and I'm always judging my diet. So when I decide like today, if I, I go lift after this and I'm going to go do a routine and tomorrow, the way I will assess if I did it well, what it will be, I felt like I can feel that I worked out. So there's like this real mild, maybe kind of soreness from the lift the day before. 
but not bad at all. Like not at all like where I'm like, ooh, sort of the touch or sort of move or I, it makes me walk different. If I feel like that at all, my reflection, and I still have this, this still happens to me. I go, God damn it. I did too much. I didn't need to do that. There was no reason for me to do that because my body, if I, if I do just enough to it, to that, that I more than what I was doing the day before, it will elicit change. It's a new signal. If you don't ever go for a walk and all of a sudden you walk 30 minutes every day, that will elicit change. If nothing else changes. Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. Only adding 30 minutes of a walk every single day, nothing else changes. It will elicit change. Well, then the body will adapt and then you won't see change. And then you have to do another thing. And then another thing, and then another thing. Same thing for the diet. If you have this diet all over the board and you're eating all this bad stuff, you're not, and then all of a sudden you go, hey, I'm going to hit my protein intake just for that. It will elicit change. And so they go way too hard. So I want to do these little incremental changes in the diet and in my training and just slowly build on that and build. And also there's a psychological piece to that. It's like you're building wins. So if I give a client, you know, just because I can handle all this training and I'm all motivated, like, and by the way, young trainer Adam used to do this where someone would come in and they'd be like, oh, Adam, I got a really busy life. I can only commit to two days a week of training. I'd be, oh, come on. You can't find a third hour or a fourth hour to get in the gym. Like we, and then I would do the whole, like, there's 24 hours in a day and you sleep this much. You weren't, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was so bad. Like that was like, yeah, I did it that too. was I the did type it of training. <laughs> Yeah, I did it yeah we're all guilty of that, right? Like <laughs> yeah. coming from the, the motivational, I need to motivate this person to be in the gym. Such a terrible approach. Opposite approach now. Someone goes, Adam, I only I can only do two hours a week. I'm like, perfect. Great place to start. Let's just start with two hours a week. That's excellent. Sure. Are you sure you can do two? You want to start with one? And I'll, I'll even go the other direction. They're like, oh, no, no, no. I can, I can definitely do it. Okay, great. Let's start there. And I would start there. And then I, I in, in if they weren't doing two hours of training before, and now I got two hours of weight training. And I'm also impacting the way they pro potentially nutrition, their nutrition. Oh my God, I can show massive change, massive change in somebody's body by just strength training full body two times a week and making good food choices. I could, by the way, I could take that 30% body fat person down to 10% by doing that. In fact, Sal's story of Doug and how they met is that Doug was a chronic overtrainer and wanted to be ripped. That's why he hired Sal. And Sal moved him all the way down to two times a week. And Doug built more muscle and got more shredded than he'd ever been in his life in his late, his mid forties training with Sal. And that, that's their story. And it was two days a week. That's all they, that's all they trained. And he made sure he had his protein take, fed his body, took care of his sleep and his body responded and changed. And so that's the mistake is doing too much too fast. And so I would caution people and say, Hey, let's just, let's commit to this. And then we'll add a little bit, then we'll add a little bit over time. And, and you're way better off than thinking, making that decision when you're, when you're super motivated. You mentioned that going from 30 to 10 is essentially if you do the right thing and kind of follow the approach that you're talking about, it's essentially smooth sailing. And you really don't have to make major adjustments until you're trying to break 10. Do people tend to hit a plateau when they hit like 20% or 15%? Have you noticed that? Every individual is different. And, and yes, like... It, and because I've been doing this a long time, there's like different levers that I tend to know to pull. Like, for example, uh, you know, Katrina helps a lot of her girlfriends out, right? Because obviously she's been with me for a long time. And so they always come to her, right, for advice on training. And so, so this just happened not that long ago. She came to me and she's like, hey, um, Danielle's like, she's she's plateaued and she's 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 doing everything I've you've taught me to teach them. And she's hitting her protein intake and this and that. And she's just not seeing results. And I know the person. and so. I kind of know her personality. And so she's the type of client that I would have that is timid, probably way stronger than she realizes she is. And so I remember telling Katrina, I said, when was the last time you worked out with her? And she's like, oh, I haven't, I haven't trained with her at all since she's been following her. I tell her, I said, go lift with her. And I said, go squat and deadlift and see if she's pushing herself. I said, I bet she's just putting the weight on the bar, the same weight on the bar. And she's not really trying to push weight anymore. She's just comfortable with what she's doing. And sure, she, Katrina's like, oh my God, Adam, she was literally doing 135. She was doing 185 by the end of the workout. Like we added 80 pounds to her squat just by, by, her, by Katrina encouraging her. Like you can do more than that. Let's put more on. 
and boom, she like rocketed through that plateau. And so with some clients, it's that, that, that tends to be more of a female trait. Guys sometimes are doing more than they should. Like, oh, like, you know, oh, Adam told me just to do this, but I'm going to go do this also, you know? So I got to assess what they're doing, right? They're, they're extreme. Oh, if Adam said, do this, I'm going to do that and this. Or he told me only to cut these things. I'm going to cut this and cut that. Or I'm also going to go for a run on Saturday too. Like, and they, they like to like overdo it. So, and they tend to run higher stress levels. They tend to disregard sleep. Uh, and so sometimes adjusting something like that, like it's normally smooth selling. If we feed the body what it needs, whole foods, we strength train three days a week. We take care of sleep and hydration and the basic things. And we, and we're overall healthy person, hormonally, blood panels, everything like that. If that's all normal, it should be really smooth sailing. But there are little like tweaks and it's normally my women, it's convincing them they need to push more. Normally it's my men having them not do more than what I tell them to do. Another one, if, if you weren't following my programming, it would be uh, program design. So that's a common one too, which I would also say with guys, because guys are, are, I mean, this is guys and girls, but I mean, guys even more so, I feel like, uh, love to do this, the stuff they're good at, you know, cause they want to impress the chicks in the gym. And so they, they, they do the same shit all the time, just so they, the girls can see how much weight they move on the, whatever machine or whatever exercise they don't, what they don't want to do is some bull, you know, side lunge or, you know, st- right. Like guys don't want to do that stuff, but step ups, yeah. <laughs> yeah, step ups, right. Those are all bullshit exercises are fucking hella hard to do, but those movements are because they never do them will garner the most change and results. And so guys, a lot of times it's just me making some adjust, adjustments to their programming. Guys too are, are, are notorious for like staying stuck in a rep range. You know, I, you either have the, you have the uh, bodybuilder bro guys that love the supersets, high reps, and they do all this supersetting pumping exercises that airs them all up. Or I have my powerlifting guys that never want to train higher than five or six reps. And so and so there's normal some tweaks there that I can go like, oh, like when was the last time you trained in the 15 rep range? Or when have you ever done 20, uh, 20 reps of a squat? And most of them are like, oh, my God, I've never. I'm like, okay, let's do that. And so normally I can make some adjustments programming that will break through uh, some of those plateaus if we have a plateau. One of the biggest adjustments I've made in my own workout program, and I've done a couple of the – the mind pump program. I think the last one I did was anabolic, which I really liked a lot because it, it, ch- it changed what I normally do. Cause normally I'm the guy that's like push, pull legs three on one off. I'm even doing that for a while just cause it's just, my body seems to respond well to it. But like doing some of the mind pump programs has actually just helped me. Cause I mean, I, I don't have to think about it. I go and I'm like, all right, this is the routine for today. I trust these guys. I want to support them. They're my friends and I know how to push myself with sets. But one of the, th- the things that I've that I've changed is the amount of time that I rest because I used to just do a set and I'm like, well, I feel okay. I'll just go and go back into it with like 45 seconds to a minute rest. But I found that when I rest like two to three minutes in between sets, especially on my big lifts, my gains are so much better. And I'm sure you can attest to this as well. Oh, bro. This is a, I mean, you're hitting on like, so we did an episode. I don't remember. I don't remember what it was titled. I think it was like, the seven ways to break break a plateau or something like that, something along those lines. One of my favorite things to do, two things, and you hit on one of them, to my guys to break a plateau. And these are guys like you that are like like lifters. They know what they're doing, and they're like they're at a plateau. Two go to moves for me is changing your rest period or changing your tempo. Because the 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 and tempo is one of my favorite to mess with. Because I I was like the true most guys want to be build muscle hypertrophy right and the true protocol for hypertrophy is a 422 tempo which is a four second negative two second pause two second positive right no but if you walk in the gym and count count somebody's tempo, i bet you will not find one person that does a true four second tempo two second pause two second up on any exercise and so it's like such an easy go to thing to adjust or like you said rest periods almost everybody and this is both sexes are guilty to resting about the same they change their exercises they might change some sets and reps but they always kind of rest the same and so like one of my favorite things to do is assess are they uh and there by the way there's there's tends to be you tend to be on one end of the other of the spectrum you're either the uh you know circuit bro who like never rests longer than a minute or the chick 
cardio chick who loves classes never rests more than 30 seconds to a minute, or you're the powerlifting dude that lets rest for five minutes between every set. And the best thing to do is to send them on the opposite spectrum and they'll, they see huge results right away. Like, Oh, you're the, the cardio girl or the, the, the superset bro who never rests for a minute. I'm going to make you rest three minutes and it's going to drive you crazy, but I'm going to make you rest three minutes and I'm going to really stretch your capacity to put more weight on the bar and let's focus on being strong and lifting like a power lifter. And if you're my power lifter guy who loves to rest for three, five minutes in between, I'm going to blow your mind and I'm going to be like no more rest than a minute. And we're going to go from exercise, to exercise, to exercise. And both those are great plateau breakers uh, for people. You know, I had Kelly and Juliet start out on the podcast. I don't know if it was earlier this year or last year, but Kelly was saying we've done a really good job at getting f- people who are enthusiastic about health and wellness, like healthier, but a really bad job at getting the general population healthier because of the confusion that I think exists online and that even nutrition has become controversial where like things like broccoli and oatmeal and stuff that's been now that's deemed to be like super unhealthy and people are so confused like at the beginning of my training career like my biggest issue with my clients was convincing them to stop eating processed food now the biggest thing is the dispelling the myths and the confusion amongst the the, the diet wars that exist what is your like thoughts on this and like the no bs approach to nutrition for you you are literally highlighting the success of the business this is why we had the success we had when we got together the four of us when we first met 10 years ago over 10 years ago now and we saw the podcast space we were looking at youtube social media and we saw the information that was being provided it was this big echo chamber for fitness enthusiasts all the conversations were the smart trainers and doctors and professionals that wanted to debate the different programming and the latest study and what what science is coming out to support this diet and that diet. And it's like the really the, everyone that was arguing fighting were all the fitness fanatics. And meanwhile, the general population was getting lost in the weeds. And our experience, Justin, Sal, and myself, came from training – normal people. I didn't get to train fitness fanatics. My entire career, so was their careers, was based around training the general population. So when we when we came into this media, social media space, and we heard the conversations that people were having out into the ether, right, to that the, to the general population, basically, and we're going, this is not the stuff I communicated to my clients. Like, this is not helping any of them. This is stuff that my peers and I love to debate and talk about which like example you'll see it in in this interview there's going to be some trainers and professionals maybe some doctors are getting there going to try and argue something i said and you know refer to some study in science and it's like what we knew to do was to ignore that noise and to focus on our clientele now the irony of this uh, we thought was this is hilarious like you have all these fitness people that think they're helping people by dropping all this great high-level science and arguing over the diets and and stuff like that, that are really only speaking to about 5% of the population, that are really, really glomming onto their information and learning from them and changing their behavior. They're already fitness fanatics. Meanwhile, they're leaving the 95% behind or frustrating them. And so when we came in to do this, we agreed on that. We said, listen, don't get caught up in what all, everyone's going to want to debate and argue with us and so like that. Stay in our lane. Stay focused on helping the general population, communicating the information that's going to change and help their lives, communicating the information that we had already done for decades to regular old people, and don't let these people distract us on our mission. And we built this thing literally around that. And let, that's why it's so successful. We had no media experience. We weren't. We didn't have any strategies on algorithms and social. Like None of that stuff. It was like... Let's go out, let's go address the 95% and let's go help them. And let's not worry about all these other people that are going to want to debate and argue over the latest and greatest science. Now, to our benefit, I've got somebody like Sal, who is a science nerd and has read all the studies that they all debate about and has all the experience of training clients like Justin and I have in person. So we've got the knowledge and the and the science nerd to debate all the doctors and the science nerds that want to get into that argument 
and we have the communication and the experience to be able to filter all that and then disseminate that information to the general population. And that has literally been like our core values is like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go out. We're going to sift through all this stuff that these people are making it more difficult for the average person. And then we're not going to, we're not going to get focused on debating people and that are our peers. And we're going to focus on helping the general population and helping them understand all this noise in this space. And that's, we've built a very successful business purely off just doing that. And so like peeling it back even further, like what do you think are the nutrition guidelines other than the protein, which you talked about that you think people should, should follow? It's that easy. Protein as the course cornerstone, whole foods. That is literally it. It is, it is, it is, it is that simple yet it's difficult. It's hard. You know, what does that look like coaching somebody through that process or what does maybe a blend of that look like? Well, it looks like this. It looks like my goal, because let's let's be honest, do I not ever eat something out of a wrapper? Do I not ever eat processed food? Of course I do. Of course that makes its way into my diet. But I'm not, I don't fool myself because it's a protein cookie in a wrapper. I don't fool myself into thinking that's actually healthy or good. Like my goal is always to prepare my meals, to eat whole foods. I recognize that sometimes I eat a bar and a wrapper. Sometimes I have to order food from DoorDash. I recognize that that happens. And then I do my best in that situation to make the best choice I can that's the healthiest for my body. But I, I, in my head, I'm going, oh, that's not a perfect day. And I'm always striving. I'm striving for perfect, recognizing I'll never be perfect. And that, and that to me is the, the North Star for our clients is like, your goal is to try and hit, get to eating whole foods, all whole foods, and hitting that protein intake through it. If you need supplementation, you're using things like protein powder to get there. But the goal is to be striving for that and getting closer and closer to that perfection, recognizing you may never. But following that those principles, again, is going to lead you down a very, very healthy relationship with food and a healthy body and physique by doing that. It's amazing. People, I think, when they hear this or they're watching this, they're they're listening and they're like, you know, I think this all sounds great. I haven't eaten healthy in 10 years, 5 years, 20 years. And oftentimes people, at least in my career as a trainer, they have this all or nothing approach where it's like, I'm going to shoot for this goal of eating mostly whole foods and keep my protein high. And then the minute I don't get there, I'm going to quit. Like what advice do you have? for the person that has this all or nothing mentality that hasn't developed these healthy habits so that they can stick to it. Okay, so that's a really cool point and and bring or brings me to another point and another strategy that Justin, Sal, myself all eventually came to, even when we weren't friends, but took it took me almost a decade before I figured this out. And that was instead of having this all or nothing approach of I have a client who's never ate healthy, they eat all this processed garbage food and now they're starting with me and now it's like, okay, switching all the whole foods. Like, oh my God, that's like, that's too much. It's too overwhelming. It's setting them up for failure. And so what I learned to do, this was back when I stopped doing meal plans, right? So back in the day, somebody would hire you and you would write out a meal plan for them. And the way I explain that to people today, like why we teach trainers not to do that, is because like giving the answers to the test, right? They're not learning anything by doing that. So you're not, you may be helping them with the answers uh, temporarily, but they're not really going to learn any new behaviors or take that and change their life with that. So you, you can't just give them the answer to the test. You have to, you have to, you have to bring them along. You have to educate them to get there. And when you have somebody that is so far removed from whole foods, you do not want to take that person and go, okay, no more fast food. All we're eating is whole foods because they, they'll end up rebelling and they'll end up failing a better strategy and what we do when we get somebody is I don't tell anybody how to eat. Like I go, okay, so let's say you hire me today and you wanted to lose a significant weight and you're this person. You, you eat horribly and you know you do. Like you know you've never eaten whole foods in your life before for a whole day. So I go, hey, this is what I want you to do, Doug, for the next week to two weeks, depending on how – if I can get two weeks, I prefer it, but I'll, I'll take a week. I can get a lot done in a week. A week to two weeks, I want you to track what you eat. And I want you to eat whatever you want. If you normally have a Snickers bar every every day at noon, have that Snickers bar. If you normally drive through McDonald's for breakfast every morning, have that. I want you to do that. What I want to see is I want to see what a normal week or two weeks looks like in Doug's life. 
And then what I do as a trainer is I look at that and I assess that. Now, here's what you learn when you teach people this way over years and years and years, and you run into these situations of people that that, that that's such a drastic difference, is rarely ever, not ever, not really ever, never is somebody who eats all process or eats out is getting all the things their body needs, meaning almost always, kind of like how I told you the four supplements that people are deficient are, are deficient in. There's also things that people miss in their diet when they eat a bunch of crap food, processed food. They almost always are missing on protein. They almost always don't get enough fiber. They almost always don't eat enough healthy fats. They almost always overeat saturated fat. They almost always are over consuming in, sh in sugar. So now I've got five levers right out the gates that I see like are big misses. And instead of telling somebody, don't eat McDonald's for breakfast anymore, I'll tell them to go get something to add to the diet. This now this as again, this will cause issues online here because there's this is not nutritional science. This is behavioral psychology. This is understanding the behaviors of people that have this really bad relationship with food and if I rip it all away from them right away and tell them to do this, I know they'll fail. So instead of telling them they can't and don't, I say, "You know what I need you to do, Doug? All I want you to focus on. I'm not going to tell you to stop eating McDonald's." I'm not going to tell you to stop eating that Stingers bar, but all I, our first step is this. We need to get you to 170 grams of protein a day, okay? So for the next week or two, that's all I want you to promise me is we hit that. So I'm not going to tell you don't do McDonald's. I'll tell you that, but let's go after 170 grams of protein every day. And you're like, wait a second. I can still have my Stingers bar or my – like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So long as you get your protein. That's all I care about. So that's where I want your head to focus on is just go get that. What this does – is it does not put them in that tailspin of I can't or I want to rebel. It's like, he ain't telling me I can't have this. Okay, I can, I can prove to him I can go get it. Now, what I know from my experience is when someone actively goes after 170 grams of protein, good luck eating a Snickers bar, ice cream, McDonald's. Or like, what ends up happening is something's got to give. They're, they're going to have somewhere where they normally would have made this bad choice, they now have to go actively after this high protein, better meal. I also know that protein is very satiating and hard to get lots of grams of protein. So they'll have to go after it. And what will naturally happen is that other stuff will fall off. And so I'm telling them to go do that. And then two weeks goes by and you're, you're, you're crushing, we're hitting it and everything like that. And you're loving it. Cause I'm not telling you, you can't have anything. And now I do the same game again. I assess the diet. Now you're hitting protein like crazy, but where else is he missing? It's like, Oh, we're still not getting enough fiber in the diet. Again, not going to tell you don't have anything. I'm going to say, this is what I want you to do now, Doug. We're going to add two cups of broccoli or whatever your favorite vegetable is because I want to get your fiber up. Two cups of broccoli to your day every day. You're hitting the protein intake. Stay the course. We're doing great. You're crushing it. I can tell already you're starting to build muscle. You're getting stronger in the gym. We're celebrating your wins. Now the next hurdle, next thing we're going to do is let's add two servings of vegetables a day. Here's your choices. I'll give them some choices. Can you do that? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, you, I, I can still have my Snickers bar. Or I can like, yeah, I'm not going to tell you you can't have that. But as long as you do this, and then I'm going to do that to them. Say, and then what ends up happening is over time, as I tell them to go after these things, it starts to fill the space of those bad choices they had before. And the reverse psychology that you're doing on them by not telling them they can't have something is huge, it's paramount to their success and them not rebelling, them not giving up, them not feeling like a failure. That way, if they do end up having that Snickers bar, they do that thing and they don't feel like, oh my God, I failed my trainer. No, no, no. Our goal is just this, just focus on that. That strategy to getting somebody who you mentioned that has like a really hard relationship or has never ate healthy foods before is the way, to, is the only way in my opinion, because I've tried it a million other ways and never had success. It wasn't until I hacked into the behavioral psychology side of this and figured out, oh, wow, if I stop telling people they can't have or don't do this, and instead I say, go get this, I would be far more successful. One of the other big challenges I think that exists is maintaining weight loss, fat loss, a level of leanness. Like I think people sometimes they'll do like a 12-week cut or an eight-week cut, or 16, whatever the example is, they'll get there, and then it's like, well, how do, how do I maintain that? And sometimes it can be really hard because kind of stuff comes up, life happens. What have been some of the things that have helped some of your clients or even yourself as a pro bodybuilder? 
like maintain a certain level of leanness without like losing your mind. That's because they did it wrong. That's why that that's why the way this conversation started with the maintenance to increasing calories to building muscle when your goal is fat loss is so paramount because of that exact reason right there. Because if you take somebody, okay, let's say let's you keep using you, Doug, as an example. So let's say you want to lose 30 pounds and I assess your diet and I see the way you're eating and you're only eating, say, 2,500 calories. I mean, we could pull you all the way down to 1,000 calories or 1,500 calories, and you will lose weight. I mean, that, that's science. But what will eventually happen is you'll adapt. Now, let's pretend like you actually got to your goal. You know, make, Let's say you went down to 1,500, you lost some weight, plateaued. Then you dropped down to 1,200, lost some weight, plateaued. Then you dropped to 1,000, lost some more weight. Now you hit your goal. You're at your leanness, but you're eating 1,000 calories a day. You're training five days a week. It's not sustainable. And so what ends up happening is you don't maintain that leanness. It goes right back on. And that was because you did it wrong, because you started this whole process. And there are some people that will can discipline themselves to actually push their bodies to that extreme, to actually get to that goal. The problem is they'll never keep it because it's not a sustainable place to live. And this is why when I get you, if I were to build your metabolism up, and let's just say using hypothetical numbers, I ramp you up to now eating 3,500 to 4,000 calories a day. And you haven't lost any weight yet, but I've got you eating 3,500 calories, but no weights come off the scale. I have had massive success with you. Even though we're not we're not anywhere closer to your 30 pounds off the scale yet, I've got you eating 3,500 to 4,000 calories because what that tells me is I can now take Doug from 4,000 to 3,500 for a couple weeks, then from 3,500 to 3,000 for a couple weeks, and then 3,000 down to 2,500 for a couple weeks, and then maybe all, and then this whole time you're just losing weight. And when you get to your goal, you're at a place like 2,000 to 2,500. Um, you're, it's a sustainable place. It's a place where you can have a little bit of balance in in your diet, where you, every once in a while you enjoy a night out where you have a glass of wine and it doesn't throw you way over your calorie intake. But if you just start cutting and adding activity right out the gates, this is where people end up. They end up in a place where they're doing the most activity they possibly can and they're eating the least amount they possibly can and it's just not sustainable for long term. It's not a realistic place to live. That is why you have to do it the way. I'm, if you want to be successful, you have to do it the way that I'm saying. Otherwise, you end up in that place you're saying where they get lean but they're in a place they can't sustain. Right. And every so often I'll make, I'll share a post on online where I, I share a photo of myself with lifting my, my shirt up and I'm incredibly shredded. Like every ab, I mean, I must have like 12 pack, you know, just pop all my abs, my abdominal muscles, my obliques, everything's showing. But I was the most, one of the most, it was one of the most miserable times of my life. And I know we touched on this in our last conversation, but I think it's an important thing to kind of bring up again is the importance of improving the relationship with yourself and how you feel about yourself internally while you're on this journey because otherwise this getting lean, losing body fat becomes a, becomes a drug. Talk about the importance of that. As a trainer, you always know when you get somebody like this. They'll say things like, I just want to lose this weight and I'll be happy. You know, or uh, this, I'm so depressed because I'm fat. You know, they say things where because of their weight, they're this way, or if only they were here, they would be happy. And when you hear that as a trainer, it's a like, at least for an, an experienced trainer, it's like an alarm bell goes off for you. Like, Oh no, 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 no. Like, and you know, right away that you have to help this person with their relationship with themselves because nobody gets lean and becomes happy. You become happy and then maybe you get lean, but you don't get lean and then you get happy. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people is they think that the weight is what's causing them to be unhappy. No, there was something that made you unhappy. Therefore, you put on the weight. Therefore, you didn't have a good relationship with exercise and food. Like, And until you learn what that is, the root cause of what caused all the weight. Because let's, let's compare this. And I know that you have, you know, you have some experience with talking to people with like addiction and things like that, right? And you have somebody who is addicted to a drug you know a lot of times when you're addicted to a drug it's it's not just the the drug isn't just the problem right many times they have some underlining trauma that they're using the drug drug to medicate or run from that trauma 
And even if you get them off, say, the cocaine or the heroin or whatever drug it is, if they don't solve the trauma or the root cause of that, they just trade one addiction normally for another addiction. I'm sure you've seen this before. When you get somebody who is obese or is put on a lot of weight for a long period of time, you're seeing the exact same thing. It's just it's only manifested in body fat and the drug is food. And so the same thing applies, though. J just me fixing the food isn't going to solve that person's happiness. They have to figure out what got them there in the first place, whatever, what, whatever trauma, whatever makes them not love themselves to allow themselves to get to that place. And it's not them getting to a certain weight. It's actually them solving that, which a lot of times good trainers will have relationships with therapists and work in conjunction with them. Like later on in my career, as I piece this together, I always had like a therapist at a phone dial away so that when I had a client like this, that I knew I wasn't qualified to really help out. Now, over time, I think I acquired the skills to help manage and help somewhat, but that's not my profession. I know that. And if I got somebody like that, I would always encourage them to, to work on that first because or at least in conjunction with me helping them with exercise. It's because I can only get you so far. I can push you and work you out and tell you all the best exercises and all the best supplements and write a meal plan for you. But if you don't solve why you got here in the first place, you're bound to go back there again or just trade that addiction for a, another addiction. I can't stress enough how important it is if someone's watching this and they're very overweight, they know it, they're unhappy with it, and they think that getting in shape is the, is the answer to them feeling happy or better, I'm going to save them all the time and trouble. Don't do that because you'll end up putting all that work and effort in there, and maybe, maybe you get there, but you'll find at the end that you won't necessarily be happy until you put the work in, until you put the work in on loving yourself. And this is a famous quote that Sal always says on the show all the time, like exercise and train yourself like you love yourself, like you would love your son or daughter. Like if you treated yourself the same way you would treat your son or daughter, you would be far better off. And what that means sometimes too is like, I mean, you wouldn't give your kid, anybody who's listening who has a child, you wouldn't just give your kid candy for every meal just because they wanted it. So same thing with yourself. Like you shouldn't just, because you have urges or cravings, you don't give in to those all the time just because you want it. No different than just because your kid want, would love ice cream for breakfast every day. You wouldn't give it to them. Why? Because you know you're not loving them. You're not loving them by giving them that food like that. That's not healthy for them. That wouldn't, that's not, that's not the way to loving them. So the same way you have to learn to love yourself. And part of that journey is working on that trauma, figuring that out. So that way, when you make choices around food and exercise, you're doing it from a place of love. I go to the gym, not because I want to change my body and I don't want to be fat. I go to the gym because I love myself and I want to take care of myself. And I want to be the best, healthiest version of me because that is the best version of me. I'm a better dad. I'm a better partner. I'm a better coworker. When I'm healthy, when I'm fit, when I'm strong, therefore, the motivation for me to go do that is not the way I look and my image in the mirror. It's the way I feel and the type of person I am when I take care of myself. You've got to get to that place if you're going to be successful. So you've talked about that, the relationship to yourself, and then what you covered in the beginning as far as being like non-negotiable things you must do in the context of building muscle, getting lean, losing body fat, et cetera. Anything else you'd like to add that is as instrumental or as important as the things we've discussed already? I think having a good support system and a good port a good partner is extremely valuable i didn't learn this until i got older when i was in my 20s you know if i had to make a list of like oh the perfect woman or the perfect wife you know i had these attributes i don't think on that i thought because i was this trainer and i was so healthy fitness mind like i don't need someone like that i'll take care of that for us i'll be the fitness person but i'm human and I've dated people that they don't they don't care about it the same way I do. And I'm I'm easily susceptible to going down their path of bad choices and behaviors and things that aren't serving me and aren't taking care of me. And so, and I've also trained so many couples where the partner is not health conscious, doesn't care about it, and they do. 
And that's really, really tough. And so for the young listeners that are listening, I I would definitely consider that if I'm looking for a partner, that if you value that, if you value your health, you you value taking care of your body, exercise, eating properly, then finding a, a partner that values it as much or more is probably a really, really important trait if you're going to be successful at it. And then seeking out those type of friendships and relationships. I give this advice a lot when I talk to uh, other entrepreneurs that are that are looking for mentorship and like building their business. Like you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And if you want to reach this certain level of success in business, you need to be hanging out with people that are doing what you want to do. And if you're all you're hanging out with all your loser friends and you're the most successful, it's going to be really hard for you to reach that next level. Well, it's very similar with health and fitness too. If you hang around a lot of people that drink and smoke and eat like crap all the time and you're the only one that's trying to make healthy choices, whoo, that's that's tough. And so and it, and what's really tough is when those people have a long relationship or attachment to you. You guys have history. You go back many times attached to childhood stuff, but evaluating that and recognizing that You are now at a place where you've recognized that you want to love yourself. You want to take care of yourself. You want to be healthy, whether it be for yourself or maybe you're a father or a mother now. And the people you are spending the most time with don't value that the same. This may be the time to start to seek out new relationships and change your circle, the five people you spend the most time with. And when you do that, a lot of times I get asked, well, how do you do that? You go break up with your old friends and tell that that's such an awkward I was like, no you don't do that it's, you know what's funny it's the same advice I give with the nutrition I don't tell you to stop eating your stingers bar I don't tell you to stop hanging out with Steve just because Steve's a loser what I tell you to do is go actively go find people that you want in your life and start to fill your time up with those people and what will naturally happen is you won't have very much time for Steve anymore so you need, to, you need to understand that you don't have to have this big breakup call. You don't have to know, tell Steve we can't be friends anymore because Steve's fat, lazy, and doesn't care about his health and fitness. All you do is you go start surrounding yourself around people that do care about that, that do share the same values as you do, and making time for them. And what naturally will happen is you won't have as much time for those people that are dragging you down in that pursuit. I can't stress that enough at how valuable and important that is if you are going to not only be successful in the temporary, like getting to your goal, but also maintaining that for the rest of your life. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat for men. This is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible. But not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of, like, body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body